Welcome to Any Combo Lords, joining me today in the Combo Classroom. Another mildly noisy day in the neighborhood, they're doing a lot of construction around here, but still a sunny, nice day with a lot of cool wildlife out here. And I don't just mean the flies, that I might need to bring the Venus flytrap back closer, because we have still been doing a lot of fruit experiments, and the unfortunately the flies like that. I mean things like squirrels as well. In fact, just not too long before this live stream, maybe about an hour before... I was out here preparing and I had this bag of nuts out here and I left it unattended and a squirrel looked like it was about to snatch this whole thing or something and I came closer and the squirrel scampered a little further and well, I don't need to explain the rest of it. I actually have a video of the rest of it. Let me pull open the video I have of what happened after that. Here is what happened right before the stream. Pretty cool. So. There's a squirrel. And there's some nuts. And I was like, okay, uh, how am I going to do this? I need to get a nut to the squirrel without scaring it. So. I was trying to film it, but I was mostly focused on being quiet, so I didn't spook it. And it's coming a little closer. And uh, the camera angle's hard because I was also trying to get the nut. I had to rip open the bag while I was doing that. Trying to do it as quiet as I could. Now, there's the squirrel, and I was like, okay, I don't, okay, he's got a little spooked. He went a little further. Where should I put the nut where I won't spook it? Okay, he's a little further. Here's a nut, dude. And then, wait a second, he's right there, and yeah, baby, he got a nut. Now, he also gets a lot of these from other sources, maybe other neighbors or something, because I see their shells around a lot, and good for them. He has a whole family, a bunch of squirrels that do wild stuff around here, and I love them. I, in fact, brought the nuts back out, although I brought them back in in the meantime, because when I left them unattended, he looked like he was about to snatch them. But then I uh, brought the nuts back out because I figured if we happen to see a squirrel come close, I think they can detect the scent of it. Maybe even the sound if I like rattle it. And if we leave out some nuts, you know, the goal is still to attract the squirrels closer and closer so that they can hang out on the desk while we do live streams and videos. So that's our little squirrely intro. Now for our actual, more typical intro. Love you all, thanks for joining me, and as usual, I am Demotro. This is actually my bonus channel, despite more subscribers, and there will be a new main combo class episode coming out in about two days or so, about some more number theory. Make sure you've seen the last one, which was about a bunch of crazy edible fruits. Today's live stream will have some fun edible things in it. I have, in fact, uh, about three or four edible things for me and this one for the squirrels but also three or four separate things for me that uh, are interesting foods for you guys perhaps they're not in the we're going to be eating the peels to be crazy category like the last episode we filled up on enough peels for our month's quota but make sure you catch that episode at some point that one's linked in the description I have been a little absent the past few days I've been busy with variety of things uh one of which most of it was personal stuff but one of it is worth noting which was my friends sometimes hold a little conference like thing i can't tell you the actual nickname of it because it's not yet the time to reveal all of my cruise nicknames and stuff so you can look up uh all of the old like embarrassing music videos we've made and stuff in the past but <laughs> we hold a conference of sorts and People do little presentations out of our friend group of things they're interested in. And we held the third or so one recently over the weekend. And uh, guess for a moment if you know me what I would have presented about. Kind of hard to guess, I suppose, because there's a lot of topics you could imagine me being interested in and me presenting at such a thing. I wasn't sure which one to do. Like the first time I did a magic trick I had invented. The second time I did, I th believe something related to guessing 
mind reading tricks related to the number nine. And the this time, what I did was a presentation since uh, probably about 10 of the 20 people there already knew this from knowing me and or my videos. Uh, there was also about 10 or so people who still needed to learn this. I did a good old presentation about why A, the word thrieven should be in the dictionary, and B, why that relates to the fact that perhaps humanity should consider switching to a thrieven base, such as base 6 or base 12 someday, as opposed to a Thieven base, we don't even need that nickname. Multiple of five does the trick because multiples of five are rare enough that that many syllables is okay. Thrieven things are actually common enough that maybe it needs a nickname like even. Maybe it needs to be one of the ones that's easier for the base to handle. You know, if, if our base was thrieven, it would be good at handling twos, threes, to a degree, fours, and then we'd see about fives. In base six, fives would even be easy too, because it's B minus one. And then six would be easy, and seven would be easy, and eight would be easy, and nine would be easy. Oh, a base six is good. But in general, if we had a three then base, we'd be good at doing like multiples of one, two, three, and kind of four. Instead of being good at doing one, two, not three, kind of four, and five. That sounds less efficient and natural and likely to occur. You know, if you do a bunch of random stuff in nature, smallish numbers come up a lot with the way we observe things. It's like, okay, how many legs does that animal have? Probably a one digit number. How many, you know? So that could be just the human interpretation, but that's what bases should be for. Now, thank you to everybody who has commented and joined. Uh, somebody asked how I'm doing. Doing not bad. I've been pretty busy and feel like I've been slacking a little bit on some of the editing I've wanted to get out on some bonus content here, as well as bonus stuff for my Patreon people. But that will be coming throughout this week while I dedicate a little more editing time. And feeling generally good. You know, this channel, uh, we're yet another time where it's getting close to another base dependent milestone should hit 170,000 subscribers tonight or tomorrow morning it's very close to that so that'll be pretty nice this is really the bonus channel so i'm more proud of the fact that the combo class channel has passed one third of a hundred thousand it's like a fifth of the size of subscribers. But who knows how legitimate subscribers from shorts are compared to subscribers who found you from a long form video. Really the amount of subscribers on here could be equal in power to the amount in there because many of them are found me through a long form video where they know me a little better and understand the content as opposed to many people who may have subscribed after just seeing the second or third short of me pop up. Now, with that said, some topics today are going to include, as a little prequel to the next episode on the main Combo Class channel, which will relate to divisors of numbers, we're going to flash back and add some more details to a concept that was in an old episode in a few shorts, which is numbers that are based on an aliquot sum. That will be a topic that we will get to at some point in the stream. And we're also going to, like I said, have some fun snacks along the way. And we're also going to look at something I found funny, which is we were looking at a glossary of mathematical jargon in the last stream. And I'll pull that back up because I think it's a pretty fun thing. It's a, the glossary of mathematical jargon is a pretty great name for an article. You know I'm going to be into that. Jargon is essentially like within a field or branch of something, terms that may not make sense outside of there and almost sound like gibberish, but that within there are some nickname for some particular well-known concept. For example, some of these we noted I think should actually be popularized more. Like I think that we should have more people, instead of always using the term infinite, think about when it actually makes sense to say arbitrarily large, a concept close to infinity, but a little different. I also think that we should be clearer with our ifs versus our if and only ifs. 
and with our ores, whether they are inclusive or exclusive ores. I'm not sure if that's on here or not, but that's a similar concept to me. Other ones that are funny here we noted are uh, Proof by Intimidation, classic. Oh yeah, so many authors who uh, want to get their proof that they're not confident enough about. They want to make sure that people read it. Oh, they unfortunately resort to the Proof by Intimidation. Now, so let's avoid that one, Combo Lords. Now, these are better proofs, you know, by example or by inspection or such. Now, trivial is a funny one in math. Uh, a lot of readers hate it because it's sort of a cheat code for writers. If they don't want to explain a proof, they can say it's trivial. And then it's a little ambiguous whether it's actually so simple that if you don't get it, you're like, okay, I got to think about this until I get it. Or whether there's just sort of, like they say here, hand waving you off. That was a term here that maybe they were using in a similar way. Now, the funny thing about this is that I looked outward and I remembered a list that I may have shown on stream a long time ago, but I think it's one of the most underrated pages of all time online. I don't even mean the content of it. I mean, just judging a book by its cover, the name and concept of this page, I think is one of the most underrated concepts online. So lists are fun, like we have a list of mathematical jargon. And Wikipedia has a lot of lists and glossaries. We may look at the glossary of mathematics, the glossary of areas of mathematics, the glossary of mathematical symbols, the glossary of arithmetic and diophantine geometry, the glossary of shapes with metaphorical names. Look, look how many cool glossaries they have. In fact, they have a category of all these glossaries. These are gonna be fun to read through on stream someday. Leave a comment if you have a request for any of these particular topics you'd like to see my interpret or my commentary on a glossary of. Now, in addition to that, and glossary game theory, in addition of that, we have things like a list of books. But it's not a list of books, it's lists of books. This is a list of book lists. So this is an article that all the things in it are lists. So if you go to these, it's a list. And it's like we've zoomed out on this meta list. It's a list of lists in this category. And if you're a logician who likes recursive humor, it makes you think, well, if they have a list of lists, do they have a list of list of lists? Because if this is a list of book lists, maybe they have like a list of science lists, a list of math lists or things like that. And do they have a place where all of those are arranged in a list? Because if so, that would be a sort of a list of list of lists. And yes, this is the page I'm referring to as, I think the most like underratedly hilarious, awesome concept. The list of lists of lists actually is an article on Wikipedia. The list of lists of lists. That takes a little while to decode in your head. You're like, okay, so I have a list here. On it, there's a bunch of lists, each of which is a list of lists each of which lists things. So for example, here we have in the list of lists of lists, you can look at lists of writers. It's not about a list of writers. It's about, these are each pages about a list of writers in that genre. This is the list of the lists of writers. And when you zoom out further, you get the list of lists of lists. So. Obviously, you have to consider, could you zoom out further? I didn't look that deep, but no, I could not find a list of list of lists of lists online. Which means that 
In fact, I don't think there are any other list of lists of lists online, apart from pages that are quoting this or copying it. But that means that today I say, let's establish the list of lists of lists of lists. It only has one item. The one item on the list of lists of lists of lists is this really cool page. Because this is a list of lists of lists. So we only, it's barely worth the fourth level list because we only have one thing. We sort of need another list of lists of lists through a different source so we can go further and actually have two links in our two things in the list for our list of lists of lists of lists. So I hereby establish that we should get a second or third one of these so that we can clearly make a list of lists of lists of lists. <laughs> so, I, I don't know. Recursive humor like that is funny to me. It's also just pretty awesome because it's such a meta rabbit hole that if you're like, okay, lists of unsolved problems, it doesn't even take you to the unsolved problems. You have so many more pages to go through. It's these are the unsolved problems in here. Then you go there and it's the list. <laughs> so you get so many different branches of possibility. It's like you're at the beginning of the choose your own adventure or something. So uh, those are pretty fun. Maybe we'll look at some mathematical glossaries as well today. I just also wanted to note I didn't look too deep. Leave a comment if anyone else can find any other lists of lists of lists online because then we could, you know, have enough data for the list of lists of lists of lists. Somebody asked if the words Forvin and Fiven exist. I usually use Fiven for multiple of five, but like I said, less necessary because it, it's such a less frequent concept apart from the base we use that things coming in five in nature is uncommon enough, it's not that much of a problem to say multiple of five. But I think three even things show up a lot in nature and in life, and that those, per, and in math, those perhaps should get a shorter nickname like even. If you find a lot of multiples of five in your own research paper, I like the term feven to keep up the rhyme scheme, but, and to be a little clearer. Forvin, however, definitely doesn't need to exist because that not only in my sort of half-joking, half-dead-serious nicknames, but also in other mathematicians, well-known, same thing, really, half-joking, dead-serious nicknames, it's also known, officially, as doubly even, a multiple of four. So we can just call them doubly even, but where I think we should extend that is that, like, triply even could be a multiple of eight, and you could say doubly threeven would mean a multiple of nine because it's two layers threeven. And you could say that threeven even or even threeven is a multiple of six. So now the nicknames start to all fall together. And yes, threevens will get their petition before long. I've been busy on other stuff, but I have not forgotten about my threevens. I made a presentation about them to a bunch of friends and strangers the other day. So... they will show up for sure in more things, such as a whole book I might be working on related to them. Now, let's see what else we got in our comments. Thank you all for joining me here. So, let's get these lists of lists further outward. And I think it's about time for our first snack break because we have several. So, if I don't spread them all out, we're going to have a bunch of snack breaks in a row. After this snack break, what I think we'll do is look at a quick graph, because I actually do have some graphs like last stream as well to show. And while we look at a quick graph uh, after that, I will take a momentary intermission because in this stream, if I need to do an intermission, we'll do it while I have a cool graph playing. Now that I've realized to get how to get them on a cool speed and level where they can flow in their animation. Works better with polar coordinates. And so first, what we're gonna do though, is introduce our first interesting snack. Now, these are two things that I'm not gonna eat the skin of. Uh, I'm actually not sure if this, oh shoot, where is that one? Oh, I have, is that one inside? Oh no, here it is, cool. 
Oh, I need to get the knife, though. So. Level one of interesting snacks that might be normal to some people is just a very interesting texture that I saw a larger than usual variety of. And I decided, oh, I want to get those for myself and I want to show them and recommend them to people who don't know them as much. And because these ones were larger than usual. Uh, the first one is less weird. It's just less common in the area I'm from. I wish maybe that these trees of these were more common, but this is the fruit that is pronounced a few ways known as lychee or lychee, or various ways people pronounce it along those lines. I've always known it more as lychee, but some say more like lychee. You know, many words have a few ways it can go off the tongue. But here's the average size I'm more used to them being. They're like these little fruits that you cut open the skin and you get a little juice that drains out that you might want to slurp up because the juice is a good part of the experience. Then you get this strange, almost alien looking gelatinous fruit that's very interesting. But here's the size I'm used to these things being. And look at these ones that I found at the store. These are very large. So this is, these new ones I found at the store, the biggest lychees, or lychees, if that's how you call them, that I have ever encountered. And I've been eating these things my whole life. They've always been one of my favorite fruits. I think there was a time where for one of my birthdays, I requested getting something like these instead of a cake. And a lot of the guests at the party was like, whoa, I can't eat that. But <laughs> these things have always been delicious to me. And... I want to show the interesting, strange, for those who don't have these as common, like they aren't as common in America where I'm from, but you can still get them at the right stores, are secretly, in my opinion, maybe a top 10 fruit, and that is such an exclusive list. Now, there are similar fruits to these. For example, here's the lychee, and in a stream once upon a time, we also showed some other ones. There's the lychee. We also, at times, have shown one called the Longan, which is pretty similar tasting in terms of its, like, gelatinous little inside. It has a different outside, and the way it grows on a branch looks different. And there, I'm probably pronouncing these all wrong, but then there's the one called the Rambutan. And this one is very similar on the inside as well, although it has this red spiky exterior and it's funny and interesting and cool. So all of those are similar tasting in ways. This is just my representative of those that I feel like the top 10 list of fruits needs one of that family on it. So you give it like a little slice and then a little juice is gonna come out. So you might wanna slurp the juice. Then you sort of peel it and then there's a big seed in the inside, but before you get to the seed, you get this gelatinous thing that's very interesting. The texture is like, some people are gonna hate this comparison. It's gonna make it not sound good to them. But the texture is almost like a squid or something. But try and imagine that is actually in a good way. Actually, I also like squid, but I might be allergic to it because I developed a seafood allergy to at least shellfish. But we still need to test someday, once we get an EpiPen or something or a doctor on set, whether squids are in what I'm allergic to or not. Mm-hmm. That is so interesting and different tasting. Both the texture and the flavor. The flavor is like this subtle, tropical, like almost like rose-like or honeysuckle-like sweet, interesting thing. Now, I am going to eat one more of these while I prep the graph just because it's so good. Sorry, folks, we're not a mukbang channel or anything, but these are really good, so I do need to eat a second one. And then I'm going to show you a cool little thing with graphs. And we will, before too long, get onto our aliquot uh, some topic. The reason I'm busting out the loquats, or I mean <laughs> the lychees, the loquats we had recently in the episode too, the lychees so early is that we have multiple other interesting snacks that are only going to get weirder from here uh, in certain ways, depending on which ones are normal to you.
You know, when we say weird, we just mean uh, less common in this area as far as fruits, but any of the fruits we're eating are often common in some area or another. Someday we're going to go on a quest for some of the berries I've never tried. I've always loved berries. And in fact, I think these could be berries. Are they cheese? Maybe they're not. But a lot of things that we have around here are berries. You know, perhaps if we see some strange tomatoes in a minute, those could be berries as well. And a lot of these different things are berries. So let's see. It says they're from the soapberry family, but I'm not sure if that means that they are actually berries, but it sounds kind of like it. Uh, I'm not sure if they're botanically berries, but Botanically, berries got a wider definition, like melons and peppers and uh, pumpkins and bananas. We did an episode about that. That was actually last Halloween. So check out the last Halloween special if you need to learn about some berries. But today we have some other interesting things, starting with our lychee. And let me pull open the graphs I was referring to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Someone asked if I like zucchini at all. Yeah, zucchini's good. You just got to cook it a lot. Um, if you uh, cook zucchini the right amount, it can be delicious. One of those things that doesn't quite have enough flavor on its own. So if you just, like, chopped it real thick and boiled it or steamed it and didn't put any spices on it, it tastes kind of bland and lame but you can make it real good. So most vegetables are good. We talk about fruits a bit more here. That's because fruits you can eat raw. And you know, maybe if we have a good cooking station, I share a kitchen with family members and stuff, but we will at some point, you know, have our own combo station once I move out at some point. And season three could, you know, take place in another location or something. We'll make sure to visit here and or bring the clocks. But once we have, you know, good time to use a kitchen, we can do more cooking related tutorials where I actually have a stove and then we can make more vegetables as well. We can also do more campfire streams where we can cook certain types of vegetables on sticks. Now, what other comments do we have here? Some really fun, cool ones. Love you all. Thanks for joining me. And... Somebody asked if the squirrels are healthy and hungry, and they are. And because you mention it, what we're going to do is we're going to put up one more nut and make some nut noises somehow. And we're just going to put it in a similar spot to where I put it for them last time. So that when I run inside to use the bathroom in a minute, I'm going to move the rest of the nuts back in. Apart from like three. So that if after I clean up the stream or if I'm looking away and the squirrel tries to steal them all, they're not going to get like 30 walnuts at once. I don't want them to pull no bank heist on me or anything. So we're going to put one nut here, leave a few nuts ready for later. And that's sort of just to lure them because if it actually comes close, I might move that nut a little closer to like on the desk or something like that because... It was so brave in that clip I showed at the beginning of the stream that I feel like it's ready to just come straight up on the desk. So as far as this graph I have here, this one is really just to start the one we showed last time, but it's not exactly the one we showed last time because we had a few different settings here. I had A and B. And so depending where I put A versus B, we get so many different possibilities. It's not just one on a slider, like it's different. There's a whole continuum of different combinations of A and B that could change this. And this is only with one line. We also had made a copy of one. This is using, by the way, polar coordinates for anyone who missed that. And it's related to the radius of stuff. And there's a secant and these are theta is referring to angles, and these are two variables. And it's a really simple equation to be doing such cool stuff. We can also set the range of it, and we're going to make it go a little wider. Uh, we'll set these up to 100 for their range. That makes them be a little bigger outward. And then we're also going to 
set these sliders to a certain range. Let's set these from zero to 100 and we're going to, we don't even need to go to 100. We'll go from zero to 10 and we'll make it a small step and we're gonna make the animation speed as slow as it lets us. And same with this, animation speed as slow as it lets us. Our range is zero to 10 and our step's going to be 0.01. So right here, they're both zero, so nothing's going on. Sometimes with the graph, you know, you can imagine why when there's zero plugged in, it might not do anything. But when we start extending them, we start getting interesting stuff. Now look, when B is zero and I grow this is just a spiral. I am hypnotizing you. Make sure you're subscribed to both channels. Make sure to respect all of your wildlife and be very nice to everybody. I am hypnotizing you. Okay, so that's just a spiral. Now this one makes it go crazy as soon as we put a little setting on there. Now, if we have both of these on, do we even have both of these on? Why is this one not showing? Uh, where's red? Why is red not there? Oh, it is there. It's doing the same thing because I accidentally set them the same. What I had meant to do was make one of them just both A's and then one of them both B's. And in fact, you know, we could put the fourth one if we really need, which is the reverse. But what I wanted to show today is we already did this to a degree, even though it's already always going to be infinitely different because each combination of four different settings here has just such a crazy continuum of possibilities. Now, let's put the A and the B as our controllers up here, and these ones here are which ones I want showing, and we don't necessarily want all of them showing at once. And let's actually make it more symmetrical. I'm gonna make these go negative 100, so they're more like symmetrical in a certain direction or way. Now, that's a pretty wild shape, but it's a little too much going on. We're going to start with just a few of them. Now, that's even just with two of them is almost too much. We'll start with one of them to start. That's already pretty wild. Look at the, what the graph does. This is just so cool. Now, it's such a simple equation. I literally only have one of them on the screen right now. Uh, and so, right here... What we did last time was these with secants. I was like, well, we've done a lot with other things like tangents and sines. Secants are a slightly less common trig function. What are other ones that are a little less common? Well, there's one called cosecant, which is actually written CSC in its thing because they it's hard for them to you know make them all three letters and the names of them are pretty bad. Cosecant and secant don't have the exact same relationship as like a cosine and sine or a cotangent and tangent. They're named pretty weirdly, but the cosecant is another of the slightly less common trig functions. And when we do that, it slightly changed it. Let's look what it did right here. We now have seven petals. Secant had seven. It was like a little rotated or something maybe. It was pretty similar. Let's see if this one changes much if we change it to cosecant. They also have cotangent. I think that did change. Yeah, so this one's like that for a secant, and cosecant did something slightly different. This one looks kind of like an eye. Whoa. You are looking into the strange eye. Now, what about the other ones? Because cosecant does appear to change it to some degree on some of these. I noticed at least some things on my own where the cosecant definitely did some different wacky stuff. All right, now we're gonna watch each of these as a cool little visual optical illusion real quick. I'm gonna zoom in a bit so it's not too chaotic on the eyes. It looks even crazier if you zoom out, but it's kind of like flickery and crazy. So here we'll be a little zoomed in so it won't look as crazy. And this is the red one. We'll zoom out a tiny bit. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, that was really weird when it like went around the bend there. Whoa, what's happening? I glitched it. I did something different. What's happening? Okay, there we go. Whoa, it went around the bend. So 
That's the red one when A and B are in that side. Here's the purple one. What if we have this one going too? There's different ways to manipulate that. Pretty wild. Zoom out a tiny bit. Whoa, too crazy. Now here is this one. The green one also does crazy stuff. And like I said, there's two variables here. So this is a completely different thing going on than if I start that one at a different point than that. Even the moving animations have a whole continuum of options based on where these are set in relation to each other. Now, here's one last one to look at. And then we can look at like combinations of them. You can put two of them on top of each other and see their strange patterns that form together. There's those two, there's those two. There's those two, there's those two, there's those two, there's those two. All right, so this is pretty wild. I'm gonna spend some more time on my own and maybe at moments throughout this stream investigating what other ones do similar wacky stuff? For example, what's the coolest place to start these in relation to each other? What happens if I throw in a third variable? What happens if I throw in a different trig function like a cotangent or something instead? For a real quick sneak preview, let's see what cotangent does. And that one's way too crazy. Whoa, stop, stop, stop. Okay, cotangent sometimes goes way crazier like tangent does. So chill out, cotangent. We're going back to cosecant. Now, here is cosecant again. And let's put a few of these on for a moment. They're pretty cool looking. I'm going to run inside to grab the other snack, put a few nuts back, and grab some water and stuff. And I'll be back in a moment to talk about some more weird lists, as well as some of those lists pertaining to types of numbers that have funny nicknames related to aliquot sums. Uh, if anyone happens to leave early, remember that some of the next stream topics are somewhat a, a background or prequel to the next main combo class episode. So if you miss any of this and don't have time for it later, although it will process as a video on the live tab, if you don't have time for it later, uh, make sure you at least see that episode should be out in about two days or so. So there's a little too wild at that level right here. Let's uh, either zoom in a bit. Yeah, zooming in helps, but also having three is a bit crazy. We'll just have two for now. So that looks pretty wild. All right. Now I'll be back in a moment and we are going to continue with some cool lists and stuff. And we'll start these from a different setting. So they're doing something different than we're used to. Might look boring at first, but trust me, it always does something wild quite soon.
All right, combo lords, we're back, we're back. Thank you for sticking around. Was the graph not doing much? Oh, I hope we're not too zoomed in to see too much of the graph. All right, we were getting some cool stuff, hopefully. Maybe it was pretty zoomed in. Okay, hopefully there were some cool moments like that going on. In any case, our main point with these graphs is, A, it's a fun thing that, if you're gonna throw stuff in the background, you know, don't be one of those streamers they're talking about these days who, just like some of the Twitch streamers who, when they gotta go to the bathroom, they'll just put someone else's video on for five minutes. You know, I support using other people's videos. I'm almost always going to be fine if anyone uses my video, even if they don't ask, as long as they credit it really clearly. And if it made a bunch of money, give some of that to me. Then you could use whatever you want, but, uh, you know, be a little conscientious of it. I think uh, maybe more streamers should find cool visuals like this to put on for their intermissions. Whoa, whoa. That was cool too, zooming in and out, whoa. Okay, so do any of these clocks actually tell time, someone asked. Um, well, purposefully no, uh, I don't think so. The ones that were ticking, I would hear them tick and I'd be like, gotta get the batteries out of that thing. Can't have it breaking continuity and can't have it just trying to be right instead of accurately being right twice a day. So as another comment noted, twice a day, they're perfectly accurate each. And since we have about 30 or 40 of them, that would mean that we're accurate like 75 times a day. Well, that's not an even number. So uh, it's some even number in that range, amount of times each day. Now, Thank you all for joining and leaving comments. Um, somebody asked about the Riemann hypothesis. I am pretty familiar with it. Uh, I do plan on making an episode out of it. It is something that I know enough about that I plan on making a 20 minute episode about it. After we do a different episode, just an introduction to other infinite series and convergence versus divergence. But I do plan on making an episode about it, but I don't know enough about it for me to be doing like research and solving it. So I know a good amount of explaining what it is and some of the current progress on it, but it's such a high level problem that I don't know enough about it for me to sit down and put in work that would help solve it. However, I do know a bit about it and you know, sometimes my perspective on things could give people a new light to look at them in perhaps. So that'll be a good episode. Uh, for those who don't know, that problem's not only historically very relevant, it was not only on David Hilbert's 1900 list of important problems, it was also on the 2000 list of important problems, but also on that 2000 list, it was awarded a $1 million prize that is still out there. You'll get a $1 million prize if you solve it. However, like I've said, the person who solves this will not be somebody who's hustling for the money because it, this is the type of thing that you have to plan to dedicate many, many years to and possibly only help solve and not do the full breakthrough and maybe only get a little advancement on this epic problem and still be proud of that because uh, it's such a historic problem that the people who solve this will spend many years on this thing. So, you know, it's another one of those problems that you'll see, I'm not referring to the commenter who mentioned they're studying it, but other people you'll see online will do the sort of Fermat's last theorem-like and Collat's conjecture-like things we've mentioned recently that relate to that like proof by intimidation we saw earlier almost, where don't trust a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, you see, because it hasn't been proven yet, but there's a lot of supposed proofs of it out there, and it's worth looking into them, but if it's one of those problems that if they're like less than 10 pages, oh boy, is it unlikely that that solved that problem that so many people have spent many hours working on. But to whoever is currently working on it here, feel free to hit me up. I've been very slow about responding to emails. Unfortunately, I'm bad with my tech stuff like emails and texts and stuff and my discord and stuff. Very old fashioned. But I'm going to go through all of my emails throughout this week and respond back to all the old people. And feel free to reach out there. My email's in the description if anyone has a cool, say, visualization or thought about one of those problems that they think 
they would like to contribute to an episode or whatever. I am down to feature people in episodes or live streams if anyone thinks they have a rather interesting thought that they would like me to interview them on. I'm not sure exactly how I would have you folks call in. I'm first planning on having some friends show up because they can be just here on camera with me. But if anyone really wants to figure out how to call in or something and has a very interesting thought they'd like to share on a stream, I'm open to that as well. Now, let's look at the next little rare snack that I happen to have here before we move on to our next number topic. And this next rare snack is not rare for everybody, but it's another one that I don't think I've necessarily mentioned before. And I think that it, it's worth everybody making sure they know, which is... So, two fruits that happen to have similar names but very different functions are a potato, which is not actually the fruit of the potato plant, and a tomato. There's even expressions designed about the similarity in names. Uh, potato, tomato, potato, tomato. You know, you got expressions based around that whole thing. Here, I dumped some potatoes in this planter bin a while ago. And some of them have done rather interesting things. They've grown these little potatoes. A lot of these little ones grew off an old dead potato that I just dropped in the compost. Here's a very minuscule one. This one had already broken off of something, but look how small that is. I did not put that in. That grew, and it is a potato. Now, we are going to try and cook these on a campfire or something sometime after we make sure the health risks are okay, because other parts of a potato plant are actually poisonous. That's not the fruit. That's the thing that grows in the dirt. The fruit is the bit that contains the seed of the plant, and potato plants do have a fruit, like many plants. And potato fruits are poisonous, because tomatoes are in the nightshade family, and it turns out that tomatoes and eggplants are some of the only nightshades that are edible. And most, maybe peppers might also be nightshades, I'm not positive. Some of those are some of the only edible nightshade fruits. Other ones include highly poisonous, toxic things. And the funny yet spooky thing is that Potato fruits look, apparently, an awful lot like tomato fruits. I even kind of wanted to grow some back there, but so much chaos happens with stuff falling that the green sprouts of the potatoes didn't keep growing, even though the lower parts kept going. But someday we're going to try and grow some poisonous potato fruits, which we will not eat. That will not be a challenge video here. It will just be to see what they look like and stuff. But those apparently look a lot like tomatoes and you can't eat them. We eat the opposite of the fruit, the bit that grows down in the dirt. Whereas a tomato, you don't eat the roots, you eat the fruits. So tomato and potato, it's a little bigger than this potato tomato pronunciation debate. They are actually an interesting mirror of each other. Similar plants, same family, similar look. Yet one of them, we only eat the fruit and one of them, we only eat the root basically. So, I don't have potatoes ready, but the reason I made that connection is because I wanted to show that little weird potato and also because I do have some strange tomatoes. What I wanted to show to anyone who doesn't happen to know is that tomatoes come in such a cool variety of colors. In fact, first, let me show you to compare a few uh, weird grapes I have. So you see this grape? And you see um, this other slightly weirder grape. And just kidding, these are not grapes. These are tomatoes. These are some of the tomatoes. Grapes and tomatoes are both berries botanically, so no surprise they have similarities. But these are tomatoes. A green one, a yellow one, a slightly more orange one. Uh, all sorts of shades of red. You get little pointy red ones. You get bigger, plumper, different shade of red ones. You even get ones that verge on a greenish red. A darker, purplish, greenish red. This doesn't even color all the shades of the spectrum. You can get even whiter tomatoes. You can get even purpler tomatoes. You can get bright green tomatoes. And that, to me, is pretty insane and wacky. 
I don't know if you can have a blue tomato is the only color I haven't seen maybe, but I bet they've come up with it at this point. They're making the fruits bigger. They're making the fruits more colors and I support it. They're doing cool breeding over time. And if you look at the old fruits that they had a thousand years ago, you don't want their old fruits. Those things were half seed. You're actually secretly glad for all the good breeding they've done over the many, many centuries because otherwise our fruits would suck. They're making them good. And so I can't wait until I envision in a few hundred years. I mean, I might not be around, but in a few hundred years, maybe we'll be eating an orange blueberry that's this big with a fork and a knife. Somebody mentioned purple potatoes. And yes, potatoes can come in many colors as well. And here we have an example of a yellowish potato that did grow off something I had dropped in there and a purplish potato that grew off something in there. These are both potatoes, but they had come from different types that I had left in there. And there are other colors of potato as well, extra red ones, extra white ones, extra yellowish ones and such. So a lot of fruits come in some strange, surprising colors. I wanted to try a little comparison of the difference of these different colors of them. And it might not be that interesting for people who have already tried these or even people who haven't, but I kind of never have really thought about all of the different colors in a row. What, what's different about their taste? So, normal red. Classic little tomato flavor. It has the cherry tomato slight sweetness of it being smaller. And it's not necessarily the best texture of every tomato I've ever had. Maybe because I got these on discount for really cheap when I was at the market getting the lychees and walnuts and some other stuff that I'll show later. But these were really cheap. There was an, I got like a huge box of these tomatoes for like $1.50 somehow. But... Also, maybe because, and don't worry, I washed them off and stuff. Everyone's like, be careful when you're eating all the fruit peels. Yes, I washed off most of the fruit peels. Maybe I forgot a few, but yeah. They, if you copy the fruit peels, which I told you not to, do either get organic ones and or wash them. But, and organic's different than pesticide free, so whatever your research tells you. But. We, somebody said, did they make, used to make glue out of potatoes? I'm not sure. That sounds logical and possible. Now, I kind of want to make an episode someday about all the weird ways potatoes could kill you because people have died from the potato cannon guns. People have died from potatoes in basements rotting and creating poisonous toxic fumes, either by eating rotten potatoes that had turned bright green or something, or by even the fumes of a crazy basement of potatoes going bad. And people have died from eating the tomato fruits or leaves of the plants. And so I kind of want to make an episode about like five ways potatoes could kill you. But that's a, that's a future snack break. We already did a snack break a minute ago. And I know a lot of people, uh, the snack breaks are just a side tangent and kind of for me too. So there will be at least a few math episodes in a row before we get deep into a snack break in a main episode. But we do a lot of snacking in our live streams to throw that in as well. Our live streams get a wide variety. But let's compare that to the purpler, greener one. Little heartier. That one I think had a little more like soul to it. A little deeper, a little meatier or something. What about the the orangish yellow? Now that one's cool because it's like light. It would be good in the right context, but it's very light. It has a lot less of that soul, but also is very like smooth and flows easily. This one might even be further that direction just from the color. Yeah, those ones are very light. They would like um they almost taste like cucumber like. 
Now, how about the greenish one? Now, that actually was a grape. No, I'm kidding. It was a tomato. Um, that one was, yeah, almost extra like cucumber-ish in a way, almost. So they're good in different ways. I think I would use the lighter colored ones if you want like not that much flavor, but it to be like very light and refreshing and like a salad or sandwich of that variety. The other ones I might use a little more commonly, but also the little ones you only have certain uses for. We do have some other ones over there I've set aside in case we use them for cooking in a future thing we do before long. Somebody also asked if I've tried the cotton candy grapes. And yeah, those things are crazy. So the cotton candy grapes are these like new type of grape they made that are these big green expensive ones. So I've only had them like once because they're pretty expensive. But they taste like cotton candy. It's crazy. Like cotton candy, that big puffy sugary stuff. You know, like you don't expect when you say it tastes like that, you're like, OK, it probably has like a hint of it. But it tastes like a half grape, half literally the flavor of cotton candy. So sometimes they're making fruits do crazy stuff. That's why I was saying it really could only be a couple hundred years before our blueberries are dinner plate sized. Now, another uh, one before we move on with two other topics real quick to show is this apple I'm not going to eat right now. But I got it off of the ground next to my apple tree out front, one of the many apple trees, one of which comes a little early. And all the apple trees are kicking into bloom right now. And this one is an example of one of the, maybe not the best apple of all time. This one's a little meatier, like a little softer than some, uh, like meatier, I mean like a little softer in certain ways, mushier almost. But if you get them at the right time, they're really delicious. And we're going to have so many apples soon in that yard that I share with family and a few other neighboring houses that I need to make applesauce. I mean, you need to make apple pie. I need to make apple everything. So throw your best apple recipes toward me or apple experiments. We could always do sequels to our apple experiment snack break we did once and take our apple experiments even further. Uh, but... <laughs> it was funny. Someone commented on the snack break like, um, did you know that apple cores are edible? And I'm like, commented like, yes, I mostly know that, but beware because they're kind of edible. I actually have a previous episode where I made my estimated guess of mathematically how many apple cores it could take to kill you from cyanide poisoning. And I believe if you ate one or 200 apple cores, you could be at risk of cyanide poisoning, depending how many seeds are in each core. I believe if you ate like a thousand apple seeds and chewed them all, punctured the skin and swallowed them all, 1,000 apple seeds, however many cores that is, I think you'd be at risk. But you can see we did an episode with a little math on that. You can mostly eat apple cores, but don't be popping through the seed and eating 10 of them or something. Now, let's see. Other cool comments, but we're going to move forward a little bit. I do have one to two other snack breaks and maybe even another one if we have to relocate that nut for the, oh, the squirrel's coming. That was perfect timing. The squirrel's going up there. I wonder if he saw the nut that's back. Let me make sure he sees the nut. Hey, squirrely, look at this. What was that? That was a nut. Okay, I'm going to keep my eye on that. Don't be surprised if I pan the camera over really quickly and uh, be like, wait, wait, look at this. If the squirrel comes close to that nut. Because if it gets really close, kind of want it. So here's what I'll also do. I'm going to make it obvious that I also have another nut for it on the desk right here. We'll put two here so that it can see, okay, you want easy mode where you get one nut there. Or you want hard mode where you get two knots and you have to be brave and come all the way on the desk. So basically don't be surprised if I pan over the camera weird. Or even if it does something really cool, I might try and film it on my phone instead here. But in any case, 
let's eat one more lychee and then transition because now I'm not going to be able to eat the fruits for a while, but they look so appealing because they're all sitting right here. So I'm going to eat one more lychee and then we're going to talk about some other number things. You guys really got to try these. These things are pretty awesome. If you get a wrong one, the flavor can be off. You got to get a good one like any fruit. But, ooh, when you get a good one like this, the flavor is just so sweet and subtle and delicious. All right, so. Now, our next topics included this thing called aliquot sums related to numbers that I think we can actually look at some funny overviews of. If we find the list of, out of all these glossaries I pulled up as examples of glossaries, I kind of pulled these up as a series of jokes of how like increasingly specific the glossaries get. Math, areas of math, math symbols, arithmetic and Diophantine geometry, shapes with metaphorical names. But <laughs> what I didn't actually pull up that's actually more applicable to here is a list of number theory categories because many of these are funny names that can be defined in two ways. And the two ways are very similar but the two ways are with what's called aliquot sums or with what's a whole divisor sum. Now, for example, a perfect number is just one that happens to be on here. Oh, look at my, I clicked perfect numbers. We were, we were on a list of lists. We weren't on a list. We were on a list of lists. Look, now I'm on a list again. So do we have, oh boy, yeah, look, aliquot sum has an article there. But here, perfect number in Mersenne Prime, we can see we've even clicked on those in streams before. They're that color. And these other concepts, too, are types of number that often can be described in terms of two ways. We've often used what's called the aliquot sum, where a perfect number, for example, has all of its proper divisors that aren't itself add up to, which is the aliquot sum of a number, add up all of its positive factors but not itself. They add up to exactly itself. But let's think about this. So for six, we're saying that six is made of one plus uh, two and three. It's just the amount of items makes uh, this thing's worth six. So one, two, three, and six, this thing's worth six. Um, we're going by how many letters are in that word chisel right there. Now, we could say that the proper divisors apart, which means the factors apart from itself, add up to it. That is one way of defining a perfect number. We can also say that all of the factors, all the positive divisors here, counting itself, add up to twice it. Now, similarly, the number 120 is triperfect. It's a multiply perfect number. That means that 120 being triperfect has all of its divisors add up to three times it, which actually means we can also define it that its aliquot sum is twice it. Because if all of the factors apart from itself add up to twice it, that's the synonymous with all of the factors including itself add up to three times it. You can just add it to both sides of the equation there to make that work. So. Perfect numbers and multi-perfect numbers are one example of something that we've often defined with aliquot sums. But I want us to remember that sometimes we can define them as well looking at the whole divisor sum. And the reason we're doing that is because the last time this came up in an episode a while ago, like a year ago or something, I had, it's one on the main combo class channel, goes into some sorts of numbers like this which is called 13 Strange Numbers with Strange Names or something like that. It's one of the older episodes, but worth watching, that goes into a bunch of numbers that all had funny nicknames that were all under the umbrella so that I could put them in one understandable episode of all being connected to, we can define them with the aliquot sum. Now, 
about half or more of those could have been defined, I think I would have to look through all of the numbers, but let's say about half of them could have been defined also in a different way in terms of their divisor number, where, for example, the multi-perfects or perfects, it's defined synonymously. We could say a triperfect number, you know, twi all, the, all apart from it, add to twice it, or all with it, add to three times it. The triperfect numbers, for example, are pretty neat. There's only six known, and it's unknown if there are any more, if there's an infinite amount, if there's no more, if, you know, there's one more, no idea. But there's only six known. Some mathematicians think those could be the only six, and the smallest is 120, the long hundred. I keep telling you it's an underrated number. When I tell you things like 6 and 12 and 120 or un and 36 even are underrated numbers, I'm not kidding. Keep your eyes out for these fellas. They're going to keep popping up. Now, other ones that are funny that we defined with aliquot sum have so many cool nicknames, like pulling open just a few that are awesome nicknames there. You get untouchable numbers, you get sociable numbers, you get amicable numbers. And funny enough, sociable and amicable sound very similar to a type that will be discussed in the next episode. Part of next episode's topic will uh, draw in a type of numbers known as friendly numbers and solitary numbers. are going to come in for some... Uh, features as part of the mystery and uh, facts going on. And funny enough, friendly numbers and solitary numbers, although that may sound to many people in their head like, is that something Demotro's talked about before? That sounds like maybe we've done that. We've done amicable numbers and sociable numbers, but we haven't done friendly numbers. There's so many types of numbers that get these nicknames that they almost get synonymous ones, but they're a bit different. Sociable numbers are numbers that if you take the aliquot sum, then the aliquot sum of that, then the aliquot sum of that, and etc., it forms a loop instead of spiraling to getting stuck somewhere. Amicable numbers are when sociable numbers are a loop of just two in length. So 220 has an aliquot sum of 284. 284 has an aliquot sum of 220, for example. Friendly numbers are different. Uh, I did notice that there was a number file episode. They've made about friendly numbers and one particular bit about a friendly number. But whether or not you've seen that, uh, this episode, I do think, is going to go a lot deeper. I mean, no, nothing wrong with Number Files videos. They're great. But there's a lot of other stuff I would have added to that that we will go into as well. Because although friendly numbers are a big feature of the episode, it's really about the divisor function and levels of it that people don't think of that are super important. Such as the first and zero width negative first, weird levels or subscripts that we can add to divisor-like functions to establish some cool patterns. And the reason I mentioned that some things have two definitions is that a few types of numbers we've seen before, such as perfect numbers and multi-perfect numbers, will pop back in with a new definition. We're going to have a brand new definition for perfect numbers, a third one to add to our list along with all their divisors apart from themselves add to them, or all their divisors with them add to twice them. We're going to have a third way of defining them to add to our list. We're also just going to learn a lot more about how divisors of numbers connect to some cool concepts. So this next episode will be back to some fun number theory. And the other one I mentioned that we saw, untouchable numbers, that's just such a great name, and they're pretty mysterious. It's one that no other number has an aliquot sum of. So this one, if you ever need to define the aliquot sum in terms of the divisor sum, where you're adding up all the proper divis or all the divisors in general of a number, all the divisors minus the number can give you the aliquot sum. So if we ever really need to define one of these things, that we know the name in terms of aliquot sum, but now we're talking divisor sum in this context, because other times one or the other name might be more helpful to use. When we're using divisor sums, we will be able to express anything about aliquot sums, but if we need to, 
in the worst case scenario by saying it's the divisor sum minus the number. However, that's not the only way to do a divisor function. That is what I call level one of the divisor function. Now, another fun thing about the, we'll save the rest about these levels for the actual episode coming out in about two days uh, on the main combo class channel. Now, what's cool about untouchable numbers too is look, Two is untouchable. No number has its proper divisors add to two. Then five. So if you're going up, you're a mathematician, you check a bunch, you're like, okay, one adds its own proper divisors add to one. Two, I can't find any, and maybe I even proved there's none, which they have at this point. Three, which isn't that hard to prove with here. Three, okay, two has proper divisors Wait, no, no, which one would add? Proper divisors would be four. Four has its proper divisors are one and two, add to three. So three is touchable. Now, I haven't heard that term. You only hear untouchable, but it makes me think the ones that aren't that are probably touchable, right? Wouldn't that be the logical way to use the un prefix? So I'm going with the numbers one, three, four, six, seven, and et cetera are touchable. There's also other nicknames that could be introduced. I want to coin new nicknames for types of numbers I've been fiddling around with that I'll make episodes about at some point. And when I made my episode about 13 strange numbers with weird names about some aliquot sums, I did coin my own one as a guess of, I can't find any other term for this and it seems useful. It seems like a missing gap in all of the nicknames they have. So I did say that a certain type of number I was calling introverted numbers and extroverted numbers. So check that out if you want to uh, see if you agree that that should get a nickname or not. Now, here, the cool thing I wanted to note is that two, five are untouchable, but then six through 51 are all touchable. If you were going through them all one at a time, you might think, okay, all the rest of the numbers might be touchable. But 52 is untouchable, and no numbers proper divisors add to 52. Now, it looks like here, if they prove a slightly stronger version of the Goldbach conjecture, which sounds pretty intense, then they will also know that 5 would be the only odd untouchable number, but that is not known. Oh, and someone has also left a donation. Thank you so much, Jan Crutiel. That is awesome and nice. Those help out so much with the live streams. I can pretty much self-fund, you know, our only props are little fruits and stuff. But uh, any donations like that are greatly helpful for our main filming, helping me work with my camera people more throughout the week, hire people to help me film and edit and such like that. So definitely helps us get out more episodes and more awesomeness. Thank you. Now... Also glad that you appreciate the energy. You know, like anyone, I have darker days and times too, but I find that being on things like live streams or my episodes with you guys does bring out the best side of me, or one of the good sides of me, and I like to try and roll with it, and we're on a good roll of uh, me tapping into a certain type of motivation when we do this, even though, like anyone, I have my own darker or more anxious or depressed times throughout the day and stuff, but... I find ways to still fall in love with fruit and numbers and stuff, so I'm glad to share it with you all. Now, let's now look at one or two other wacky nicknames of numbers that are just funny. Uh, another one that's pretty funny, is, as far as nicknames go, are impolite numbers. And impolite numbers versus polite numbers are... Numbers where this isn't related to the actual aliquot sum, so it wasn't in that episode. I think this came up in a short, possibly, but I just think it's a really funny nickname along those lines where we're like, you can get mixed up. You're like, okay, we had friendly numbers, amicable numbers, sociable numbers, polite numbers. Which one's which? And oh, don't get me started on all the varieties of perfect numbers. You have multi-perfect numbers, hemi-perfect numbers, quasi-perfect numbers. Although they don't even know if any quasi-perfect numbers exist or not. It's got a nickname, even if though they don't know if there's any. Check this out. Let me first, okay, polite numbers. 
sometimes also called staircase or trapezoidal numbers, are numbers that can be written as the sum of some consecutive positive integers. Two or more numbers in a row added up can make the number. Now, here's what you'll note. What are the impolite numbers that are not this? One, two, four, eight, 16, etc. And here they're noting the impolite numbers are the powers of two. And let's see where that is. So has that really been proven? Uh, I would have to look up to refresh my memory if that's been proven or not. But the impolite numbers that are known at least here are the powers of two. Now, looks like it might be proven here. Now, there's so many more fun names of numbers. There's ones called evil numbers we'll cover at some point. There's ones with every nickname you could imagine in the world. And there's room for more nicknames. I think nicknames help you grasp a concept. Imagine if we had never nicknamed numbers with exactly two factors prime. Imagine how much clunkier all the papers about all that stuff would be. We might not even have as many papers because it would be too annoying for all the mathematicians to have to keep writing that. They would want a nickname. You know, a nickname in a good form can be a tool to help you grasp a concept, you know? So, let's more nicknames. <laughs> if you ever come up with a random type of number, feel free to give it a nickname. Although, don't be surprised if you find out somebody else has already nicknamed it and yours doesn't stick. Oh, wow, we have another donation from William Wallace. That is really awesome, people. Love you so much for those donations. I mean, I love all of our viewers for joining me, but that is really extra helpful and cool. So thank you for those folks who donated stuff. Really warms my heart that it means enough to people that they want to keep supporting us to grow and do more and more cool things. Because I do have a lot of fun plans coming up. But like I said, I've... Uh, cut myself off more recently from blabbing about my upcoming plans because that will sometimes bite me in the butt by me over-promising and not being able to deliver on it for some reason or another. So I re remembered that it's better to under-promise and over-deliver, meaning that I... You know, sometimes I'll cut, bite my tongue a little bit when I'm about to talk about all my fun plans for the next month, just in case only 90% of them I'm able to pull off. Then it'll seem like 90% more than expected instead of 10% less than expected. In fact, we don't even need to blab about the future because we have enough crazy stuff in the present and the past. But in any case, thank you all for the donations and for the other folks joining us. Now, other types of wacky number will come up and get some refreshers in this episode. We're going to do one that comes up is hemi-perfect numbers. Quasi-perfect numbers, I don't think, are going to get a callback in this upcoming episode that is almost done. So quasi-perfect, we'll get our refresher on right now. Quasi-perfect are ones where all the divisors add up to one more than twice it, or it's um, other, it's... Uh, other divisors apart from itself, its proper divisors add up to one more than it, or all the divisors add up to one more than twice itself. So it's basically one more than a perfect number. Quasi-perfect is like one higher than perfect. Now here's, and it's a minimal abundance, but let's be careful because abundance on its own usually means the excess of how much more the amount of the sum of the proper divisors is compared to the number or synonymously all the divisors is to twice the number. However, the abundance or abundancy index is another thing that sometimes gets nicknamed the abundancy so there's a few other terms that get that nickname in a way. In this episode, one does come up that's different, and I decided to go with the full abundancy index, extra clear name. But we're going to look at another measurement called the abundancy index related to how I was saying there's other levels to the divisor function. So abundant numbers in general are a nickname for ones that have passed perfect they are you know the divisors out to more than perfect would be and deficient numbers boom roasted that type of number really got roasted with that nickname but deficient numbers are the ones that it's less than a perfect number now 
Here's a funny fact where it says, we don't know if there's a quasi-perfect number, but if it exists, we know that it must be an odd number and a square number. It must be greater than 10 to the 35th power, and it must have at least seven distinct prime factors. So that's pretty wild. Now here's like the double quasi-perfects. These are the ones that the abundance is two. These are two more than a perfect number. So that's fun that 20 happens to, you know, that's fun fact about 20. Smallest number that is as close to known to perfect, but more abundance than perfect, but the smallest possible and the smallest number of that example. So a lot of funny ones. Here's more and more nicknames. You all these wild nicknames. It's like a quasi amicable pair. It's like five bajillion nicknames they have for these numbers, and I fully support it. So, this one we're really mostly in the next episode going to be talking about the ones called friendly numbers and solitary numbers as far as weird nicknames go, but also perfect numbers, tri perfect and multi perfect numbers, and one called hemi perfect numbers that I don't know if I've mentioned before or not will come up in the episode as well. And this thing called the Abundancy Index that's a little different. So that's a pretty fun one. Um, welcome to Stick, who's joining us after work here. And that is most of the nicknames I had pulled open here. But there is another glossary-like page we were on a minute ago that I feel like will just refresh a few of the other funny ones that are worth getting a quick refresher on. What are some of these that we have already discussed related to this? Now we haven't, like some of these we've gone over in random streams, like a unitary perfect number. It's like a hyper perfect number. Look out, there's every variation of perfect number. Pick any prefix you want, and there's probably that perfect number as a type of number. Hyper perfect numbers are a little more complicated for their function. Now, some of these are generalizations of perfect numbers, where perfect numbers are them for a certain level, like a multi-perfect number or multiply perfect, are include perfect numbers as the level two of a, in a sort multi-perfects. Now, here, the Aliquot Sum article also reminds us some of the others we mentioned. These ones. We can also define prime numbers as numbers with an aliquot sum of one or numbers with a divisor sum that's one more than themselves. That is a good way. You can also define prime numbers. Here they're talking about these ones we mentioned. And the almost perfect numbers are the ones, these are ones that I mix up in my head sometimes with impolite. That's why I wasn't sure in my head if impolite had been proven. I was like, really? That was proven? Huh? I didn't realize that. But that's because I was thinking of the almost perfects, which these, the only known ones, are the powers of two. But we're not sure if those are the only ones. So an almost perfect number is like the reverse of a quasi-perfect. It has a deficiency of one. Its abundancy is like negative one. Its proper divisors add up to one less than itself, or all the divisors to one less than twice itself. Now... This is on the other end, and it's funny that here we do know that all the powers of two with non-negative exponents do this, but we don't know if any others do. And quasi-perfect numbers on the other side, we don't even know if any do or not. Could be an infinite number or none or seven. Who knows? And perfect numbers, I, I believe we still just know 51, which because they line up with the biggest primes ever discovered. And if we find another perfect number, it's going to be one of, if not the biggest primes of all time linked to it. Because there's a simple formula that turns the perfect numbers into Mersenne primes. And that was covered in a different episode of mine that was shortly after that other one, sort of as a follow-up, where we talk about hyper-11s. Because Mersenne primes and all those relate to hyper-11s in binary. Numbers composed of just the digit 1 when written in binary. Which includes, for those who forgot or who didn't hear... The biggest prime of all time. I don't know why they're not talking about this more often in schools. The biggest prime known by humanity when written in binary is only the digit one. That's pretty interesting. And there's a lot of reasons and interesting stories behind that. So 
you know, if you're going to talk about the biggest prime of all time to somebody, make sure to mention that fact that it's a hyper 11 or as some would call it a generalized rep unit in binary. Of course, one other nickname that we've mentioned are weird numbers, and the smallest is 70, which is pretty random. So weird numbers are ones that are abundant, but not semi-perfect. And I've mentioned this one a few times just because it's kind of hilarious that when you try and define this nickname, you need to know two other nicknames to be able to define this nickname. It's like the list of lists of lists. Here we got like a nickname of nickname of nicknames. But... <laughs> It's a number that's abundant, but not semi-perfect. What that means is that its proper divisors add up to more than itself, but that you can't take any subset of just one of any of the proper divisors where you can use zero to one of each and you can skip some. You can't take any subset that add up to the number itself. So semi-perfect numbers, you can just take a subset of the divisors that add up to and make that work. Like here, six is fully perfect, but still semi-perfect also, or known as pseudo-perfect as well. Uh, 12, though, is not perfect. All of the divisors make it abundant, but you can take a combo of them that do add up to it. Six, four, two would work. So, or six, one, two, three would work. There's a few ways to do it. So... These are, you know, a bigger list than the perfect numbers and a little less important because they don't one of a kind go to a Mersenne prime unless they're also perfect. But one of the big mysteries about these is whether there's any odd perfect numbers. That's unknown. And of course, the nicknames go so many levels deep. They're like, yeah, now we got to talk about primitive primary semi-perfect. Whoa. So these we will get into when we get into further levels of what these nicknames mean. But one of the main ones that will pop up in next episode will be that fella named Hemi Perfect. We'll see why. Sort of halfway on the way to uh, multi-perfect. It's another number that we can give a new definition. Some of these we are going to be giving a new definition for. Not to replace the old definitions, but why not have another definition? That'll help. So, those are some fun number things. I think I might prepare one more snack break, and while I'm preparing that, which I might need to grab a thing or two for, we're going to look at a different combination of the graphs that we had pulled up today with cosecants. So let's see what the cosecants have going on when we look at this combo. Whoa. Okay, hopefully this is a good combo that will do a cool thing for a minute. I'm going to prep my fruits and get all that ready. Uh, and then we're going to do one more interesting snack break. Whoa, okay, that went too crazy. We might have to be zoomed in for when it does that. It might look boring for a minute when we're zoomed in, but it gets way too crazy when you're too far out. Okay, so for people who want even more of that, we will do more streams dedicated to that, but I have decided it is a good mild intermission time whenever I need to grab something from inside or whatever. I will put this on unless I highly expect there could be something crazy about to happen in the bathroom. I'm background because then we will know that it'll be something fun for people to watch if it takes me a minute to prep our next snack, which, yes, is also fruit-related, but it is another interesting fruit one, a new variation on a few themes of before.
All right, folks, so this is the revenge of the combo right here. Hopefully we got some of the orange. Oh, there's the orange. Orange came back in. How are you all doing? Good to have you all around here. Let's zoom out for a moment, even though it looks quite wild out there. Okay, we will pause this. When we just have one going, it can do different stuff too, like or whoa. Sometimes we get cool amounts of things, like look how thriven that looks. It's a thriven flower petal structure, bigger and bigger and outward and outward, and now it looks like an eye or a universe. Whoa. Whoa. All right, so <clears throat> I do have one more snack here at least. I have two snacks. One of the other one I have apart from what I'm about to show would be basically prepping the lunch I'm going to eat after stream. So we'll see if we uh, make that lunch or not. But I do have one special fruit combo. That's a new variation that I'm always going to want to try different variations of a new, as we've said, nicknames are important and I want to nickname new combinations of recipes as well. This is one I call a multi-fruit and the way you assemble it is sort of like what is known as a turducken, if you've ever heard of one of those, except this one involves fruit. And you see, I have, okay, so this got a little squished in here, but what I have is, starting from smallest in a way, is this blackberry that got a little bit crushed, but it's okay, it was pretty fresh and just got crushed a minute ago, that I picked fresh out of the front yard. Oh, in fact, maybe, maybe we'll even go on a real quick field trip and pick an even fresher blackberry in a second. Now, what we're gonna do, I would have used a blueberry if I had one, but we're gonna use a blackberry. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this cherry and you know cherries, you gotta eat around the pit, and that's pretty annoying. Well, what if we take the pit, somewhat extract it without fully destroying the cherry itself, try and extract that pit in a way where the cherry can somewhat still be folded back together. So I sort of extracted that pit out of there. Now we can sort of reseal our cherry. Sometimes you can do it on a big enough cherry without even splitting the two halves. This one got split, but it'll still work once we put it in the full thing we got going on. Now, first what we're gonna do is pick a new blackberry from the front yard on a quick field trip where we might see a cat as well. And we're gonna put that inside here. It'll require a little crushing to fit in there because it's a little bigger than a blueberry, but we're gonna put a little bl blackberry mashed in there. That would replace the pit and that would already be pretty good. I would already consider that a small multi-fruit, but typically a multi-fruit will have three layers and you can even go for a four layer multi-fruit, which I have not tried yet. I do want to try the four layer multi-fruit at some point. We're gonna need something like a mango maybe on the outside. I'm not sure what we could do for a four layer one, but for a three layer one, the classic will be to take a stone fruit. And I've done this with apricots here before. I've taken an apricot uh, and replaced its pit with a cherry and replace that pit with a, a blackberry. And what we're gonna do today is try one of the other types of fruit that I had recently that was really good, which was, remember I mentioned pluots in another stream recently. If you weren't here, I was talking about how there's plums and there's apricots and they can breed stone fruits to be combinations of these. And some are called pluots, also known as plumcots in a maybe even more official way. Some are known as apriums, maybe even more officially known as apriplums. It turns out uh, this might need a whole episode because when I was at this store, they had like 10 different colors and shapes of what they were calling pluot. But this one right here is one they were calling an aprium. And that means that it's most likely further genetically toward an apricot, but with a little bit of plum mixed in. And this thing had a really good trait and a mildly dangerous trait. The really good trait was that it was a delicious fruit. The slightly dangerous trait was that the seed was, or the pit was really sharp on the other one I had. It sounds funny to say the seed was sharp, but like, I swear, if I had bit into this thing slightly differently, it would have cut my mouth. The seed on this thing, so sometimes it came out a little, little easier than the others. Some types of uh, 
apricots are usually like freestone to a degree, meaning like the pit comes out much easier without having too much attached to it. Plums can go either way. Sometimes they're a little less freestone and you got to like get extract the pit out a bit. This one wasn't as freestone-ish, but you can't really see right there. But at the tip right there, there's this really sharp point. It's like this thing, if you were a hunter-gatherer, you could use this on the tip of your arrow. This thing is sharp enough that if I had bit into this wrong, I feel like this one's not as bad. You can't see with all the mush there, but there's this really sharp point right at the end. It's like a little thorn. And if you bit into one of those weird, you can really like stab your mouth. So careful if you bite into a weird stone fruit variety, I guess. But this one, despite needing me to extract the pit a bit, does have a great amount of room to tuck our next part of our recipe in. Now they look like sort of like eyeballs. So, you know, maybe start off our video like this. But maybe we'll get, uh, maybe that'll be our thumbnail. We'll, uh, maybe we'll put that on the thumbnail later. But in any case, let's get some blackberries on a little field trip uh, by visiting the front yard, which of course I don't want to uh, show any neighbors or family people who don't want to be shown or addresses or things like that. So until we get to the plant, I am going to switch just to this screen, but you'll have my voice to guide you. And we're going to take a little stroll. We're going a little outward to this yard that I share with the family and some neighboring houses. And ooh, a leaf fell on the computer. I love when the leaves fall right in front of me. And we might get to encounter some cats. I can see at least one cat sleeping over there. Uh, we can see if he wants some pets, which he usually does. And I can see some blackberries. So folks are ready to see the fresh beauty of being close enough and aware enough of certain plants that you can pick right off the vine. Like I've said, there are areas around here where tons of these grow wild. Like here, there's gonna be like, you know, over the course of the season, maybe a couple dozen of them, but there are places where there's gonna be a crazy abundant amount. And we're gonna take some field trips soon to zones that I consider to have essentially an arbitrarily large amount of blackberries. Oh, well, you couldn't see me pick that one, I'll just eat it. We'll get a real clean pick for our interior. There we go. Now, with this fresh blackberry, we will be able to complete our multi-fruit. So, let's see if we're gonna get a quick visit from a cat real quick. Uh, the cat that's sleeping right here is Sassafras, and he's the one who was stray. And it wouldn't even like let us touch him like a year ago, and now is obsessed with love. And will just like every day come begging for pets. And here's a little sassafras. And he's really nice. So he got adopted last May, Friday the 13th. So a little more than a year ago. And he has adapted to loving pets. And he's a little sweetheart. Oh, sassafras. You see how trusting that is? He's like more trusting and loving than like even average cats. Uh, not compared to my other cats maybe because they're little angels, but he's getting as nice as them by studying their ways. He copies Dandelion all day. And he is so sweet for a boy who was so scared of humans like a year ago. He has never bit or scratched me. He's so sweet. All right, Sassafras, we're going back to the combo classroom. Don't worry, Sassafras, you'll get a cat meow or cameow, however you say it, uh, in before long, in the next episode or one after that, we have some more cool cat meows or cameows. The next episode, in addition to having some fun math and maybe a cat or two, also has 
a very hilarious stuff falling shot. I know not everyone likes the shots where stuff falls chaotically, but there was one that was just, oh no, what did I do? Did I eat the blackberry on the way while I was petting sassafras casually? I need to get another blackberry. I was so um, absorbed with sassafras that I put it down somewhere or did I eat it? Oh no, I must have, okay, yeah, I put it down right here. Okay, I found it. <laughs> I was like, what happened to the blackberry? Did I space out and eat it? No, it was, I set it down when I was petting sassafras. Here we've gotten it though. So, we'll do some more cat footage soon. And the next one also, like I said, has one of my favorite stuff falling shots just because stuff went so much crazier than I expected with how this whole chain of things fell off the desk one at a time, like dragging each other off. So, now we have the final ingredient for our eyeball concoction. Well, it just looks like an eyeball, it's not actually. Now, it's a little bigger of a pit there than we would have wanted for this cherry because some cherries are bigger and a little less room here than we would have wanted. We're gonna have to crunch this blackberry in there a little bit, but it's still gonna work pretty great. So if you were a really fancy chef, you would have a way of like half cutting this open to extract the pit without it falling apart and to like insert it or you might cut it all the way open and have some sort of fruit-based glue that you use to glue it together. Or perhaps you would have some fruit-based string that you would use to stitch it together. Those are some thoughts I'd had about it. Now, when you take a bite into this, it's really delicious because instead of having to dodge a pit, you get... A pit is a downgrade when you get to that point. You're like, okay, I was getting good fruit. Now we get a downgrade. In this case, you get an upgrade. You get a secondary flavor coming. Then you're like, okay, my secondary flavor is a cherry. Is that going to have a pit? Nope. You get a try, -ner try -ver the third flavor. So as you get past the center, mm-hmm. We start getting the rare interior. Mm -hmm. All right. Should I wipe my hands off? Now I have like a whole fruit soup here. That was like a really spilly fruit. Usually it's because it was an aprium. Although, okay, so our test concluded that those apriums taste really good, but I don't think they're as good for a multi-fruit as an apricot was. The apricot just fit better, was more consistent, had the right texture to bite through easier. This one, the cutting and chewing process left me a whole like soup I have to try and drink now if I want to get all the nutrients. Now, oh, and I better be careful leaving all these nuts out. I accidentally left four nuts on the rim. Get, four nuts is too much for the squirrels. They're going to get one or two nuts at a time. Now, that was pretty delicious. Now, those were actually most of the mathematical topics that I had planned for today's stream. If that is mostly what you are here for, uh, is the mathematicalness, the new episode on the main Combo Class channel should be out around Wednesday, and I will be uh, trying to get some of the new shorts I've filmed edited down this week, as well as catching up on some of the bonus footage for my Patreon people and stuff like that, and catching up on chatting with Discord comments and such like that. But and my catching up on my emails and all that, but still, a lot of great footage is in the vault ready for our next couple episodes. I've been starting to film a few outward at once to plan them on a larger scale. And while I am still currently editing all of the main ones myself at the moment, it does sometimes take me more than a week, although I aim to have them out like once a week. Sometimes it takes me like a week and a half, but There'll probably be a week and a half between some of the ones over the next month or two, but they're all going to be very cool. So, and as usual, you know, some people are surprised when we threw a snack break in last time and they're like, whoa, it's botany all of a sudden. That's weird and new. 
And while that's totally okay, they just didn't, you know, know the context of the channel. If people had been following from the beginning, they will know that it was like the fifth or sixth snack break, that we have done a snack break every five or six episodes. Quite reminiscent of that weird die I had. I think it might be back inside, but the one that I showed before that goes one, two, three, four, five bagels um, as its five faces. That one, uh, it already got a feature in a previous stream. And so... The next one and the next few will be back to some number theory-like concepts, which a lot of people like. And going to try and catch up on spending more time this week editing some of the stuff down, maybe even into a few bonus videos for this channel, because it's been a while since I put a non-live stream content on this channel. So we'll catch that up as well. Now, thank you all for joining me, because I think I'm going to wrap it up pretty soon for today's stream. But a lot of fun stuff uh, we did manage to cover. If anyone caught, came late to the stream, this will be posted in the live tab as a video right after. Although, as you know, I have no choice but to have the chat disappear while it processes to HD. So it takes YouTube, like, depending on how long the stream is, somewhere between, like, a quarter of a day and a whole day to, like process it to HD and then to put the chat back for some reason. I don't know why they don't have the chat go there while only the SD is ready, but not my choice. Uh, so unfortunately that's how it looks, but the chat returns if you watch these long enough later that they've gone HD again. Now, in any case, uh, YouTube's funny with some stuff like that, but I love them. YouTube's awesome. I remain spending almost all of my own, like, time that I spend watching something. Like, like many people, although I do a lot of studying and hiking and cooking and cool stuff, I also have downtime where I like to watch things that I'm, you know, half spaced out during. And some people watch a lot of movies or a lot of TV shows or this or that. Really, I pretty much only watch YouTube if I'm ever spending downtime just spacing out watching something. So, I love YouTube here. Plan on continuing on putting a lot of more cool stuff out on the channel over the next few months. And, in fact, this channel, at the end of this month, will be this channel's one-year anniversary. It's even newer than the Combo Class channel, which is, you know, a little over a year old. This channel is literally still less than a year old, which is pretty crazy. Maybe we'll probably be at somewhere in the 170,000 of subscribers after one year, which is a lot more than I expected and pretty awesome. So thank you all for joining me. Remember that if you're ever bored, we got a bajillion videos on the live tab here from before. We also have a lot of great combo class episodes on the main channel where my favorite edited down stuff goes that you'll probably not have seen all of yet and a lot of more fun stuff coming soon so thank you all for joining me gotta figure out something to do with these apples gotta confiscate most of the nuts apart from about two that i'll leave out for the squirrels in different locations we'll put one on the fence and one all the way out on the table so they have to come and be brave to get that one and We'll maybe work on a little bit of editing and stuff. Now, uh, the other snack break I was going to do is I have materials to make myself a sandwich for lunch there, but it's not quite interesting enough to do for a fourth snack break. So we'll do some cooking tutorials when we have a better setup for that in the future. But we'll also be back with all of our favorite math squirrels and other stuff before long as well. So love you all. Uh, also remember there's a discord and a subreddit and things like that linked in the description. And for anybody who happens to be able to help in certain ways, you can also help out through a Patreon or a membership thingy on here, which I haven't fully set up, but is, you know, on its semi setup already. But even if you can't, just sticking around for our future content makes you one of my combo lords. So thank you all for joining me, and I will see you before long.